Hi, this is Harold. Welcome to Transformation's weekly message and podcast. I'm glad you are making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end of today's message, but for now, let's see what God wants to teach us. May God bless your hearing, understanding, and application of God's word and message. Well, good morning, church. Great to see everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. So I don't want to forget that for sure. And you can, there you go. Peggy is awesome. Give her a hand. She's been A.B. queen today, all right? We'll put her to work, get some mileage out of her. But it's great to be here. We are in a sermon series, a Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer sermon series. And it's a two-part series. Part one was pre-recorded, and I'm glad it was because I had a major head cold when I did it. If somebody listened to it, you heard that, you saw that. Um, but that's out there on YouTube and on our, uh, our app and, and uh our website, et cetera, so you can access that. But this today we're uh, in the second part, and the title of today's message is The Cost of Discipleship. And this is a pretty heavy message because it's really going to challenge your faith. And I think last week started to do that, but this week we'll definitely do that. This movie will definitely do that. I guarantee it's going to rock your socks off. So the, the, the main idea of this message series is that Bonhoeffer's life, if you would, illustrates what the transformative power of costly grace, not cheap grace. And that word comes from Bonhoeffer. You might have heard that in Christian circles before, cheap grace, but he's the one that coined it. But he would say it's costly grace, a grace that saves and calls us to a deep obedience and surrender. So it's much more than just a raise your hand and say the sinner's prayer. It's, it's about dying to yourself and living for God's ambitions. So true discipleship demands sacrifice, obedience, and the active pursuit of God's will, even at a significant cost. And we all know, if you know Bonhoeffer's story, you know that's exactly what happened to him. Our three main scriptures that we'll lift up today are Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 24, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, and Philippians chapter 3, 7 through 8. But we're, so I welcome you back to the series, and we're in the second part of our series. Uh, and the total series is just called Faith in Action. And last week, we explored Bonhoeffer's convictions, right? His convictions that faith is not passive. It's not an abstract. You know, it's not just God, some abstraction up there. And yes, we pray to this God and we worship this God and we sing to this God and we send prayers to this God. It's not just an abstraction. If you're following Jesus, it's personified. It's, it's Emmanuel, God with us. You know, it's, it's flesh. It's incarnate. It's God, divine, fully human, fully God. Way more than an abstraction. A lot of people struggle with their concept of God because it's nothing more than an abstraction. And so if it's just an abstraction, it's hard to give your life to it. But when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about a whole different thing. And so it's not passive. Our, you know, we're not just sitting around saying, I have faith. I believe. You know, it, it, faith is going to demonstrate it in, in, in what we just sang. Follow me. Faith without works is dead. You heard that? calling today in the book of James, in, in the song we just sang. Uh, but it's to act boldly, and to act boldly for the suffering, the wounded, and excluded. You know, for, the, for, for justice and righteousness. And, and, and that could be a big theme, but you, you need to make it, I think, very contextual to where you're at. Where you live, who you are, what you're doing in your life. Starting right here, right now. Who are the wounded, the excluded, and the suffering in my circle? So you can start with that inventory alone. And I just I challenge you to do it. Just sit down with a piece of paper and write, who are the wounded, the excluded, and the suffering in my circles? And then you can expand it to Jefferson County. You can expand it to Missouri. You can expand it to the United States. You can expand it around the globe. But start in your own backyard because that's where you're at. Bloom where you're planted. And who are these people that are around? Because everybody wants something to eat. Does anybody here not want something to eat? Anybody? And I mean something good to eat, not just something to eat. Does anybody want something to drink? You know, and clean water and uh, refreshing clean water? Anybody here want to not want a hot shower or a place to lay your head? And, and not that it's got to be a mansion because when you turn out the dark, you know, lights, whether you're sitting in a mansion or a Hotel 6, you're still, the lights are out, you don't care at that point. But I mean, a, a safe place to lay your head at night. Is there anybody that doesn't want that or want to be loved or respected or just affirmed or, or just, you know, acknowledged even? I mean, this is what we're talking about. So when we say the wounded, the excluded, and the suffering, we're talking about that. That. Who are those people? In, in Jefferson County alone, there's 2,500 homeless people. 
It's not like St. Louis. I could drive you down to the city and show you a bunch of them. Where are they at here? They're in the woods. They live in the woods. And they don't dare come out on the street, sleep under the bridge. Why? Because a lot of the riffraff in, our, in this context would just pull over and beat them to the next county or threaten them to the next county. And that's why you don't see them. Because their lives get threatened or their bodily injury, they're threatened with bodily injury or we're going to take all your stuff and burn it or throw it off the bridge or whatever. So if you're living under that kind of threat, you're not going to expose yourself to the daylight. So you're going to sleep in a car, you're going to hide out wherever you can, just try to survive. There's 2,500 of those people. Think about that. That's a lot of people. So what do you do with that? Mental health issues, people that are suffering from anxiety and depression and Substance abuse, go on down the line. It's a big number all around the globe, but definitely a big number in Jefferson County. What do you do with that? I mean, Jefferson County was the number one county in the United States for methamphetamines for years, for years, and it's still in the top three. And it's a big county. Jefferson County is a huge county. What do you do with that? See, now you could take the position, this is what a lot of people do, well, they shouldn't be doing that stuff. And what they do to get unhoused in the first place? And what they do to get addicted? And why are they in jail to start with? And you see, it's easy to point to them and say they just get what they deserve. You're not going to say that out loud. Maybe some will. But that's what you're saying. You don't know their story. You have no idea what their story is. They're just in a compromised way. And you're like, well, you shouldn't be that way. I'm not living that way. Why are you living that way? You know, so I'll send you a check, you know. I'll give you some charity. A lot of people are doing kingdom work. It's just charity. You know, it's nothing more than charity a lot of times. It's, it's not walking shoulder to shoulder. It's not justice. It's not helping you get out from underneath where you're at. So there's a big difference between charity and walking shoulder to shoulder with somebody. It's, it's a huge difference. If you, say, if you say that I am going to stand for justice for, we'll just, we'll just say the people that are hooked on methamphetamines. Well, how are you doing that? You're putting a Facebook post out, hey, we're praying for all the people hooked on meth today. I mean, that's not a bad action. I'm not taking away from that, but that's not justice. I mean, how are you walking with these people? How are you walking? How are you, are you in solidarity with these people? And if you're not, then I would push back big time. Don't, don't tell me you're, you're, you're all about justice for these people if you're not doing anything. And this is where Bonhoeffer is going to, he's going to challenge it. You're going to hear it today. He's going to be in your face about it. That a church is not an action, is not a church. They're nothing but a facade. That's a pretty heavy me- message, but it's the truth. And, you, and then you've got to personalize it to your own life. If I say I'm going to follow Jesus living God, live a Jesus-centered life, then how can I prove it? How does my life evidence of that? What am I doing? And you can't be all things to all people. You can't be all things to all people. There's lots of injustices going on all around us. But where are you called to? And not everybody here is necessarily called to the same calling. Some may be addicts, alcoholics, addicted people, substance abuse. Some may be the unhoused. Some may be the ones that are just wanting something to eat and you're, you're really engaged with the food pantry and trying to meet these people. But more than just giving them food, it's like how can we help you get out from underneath where you're at? You know, how can we bridge the gap and get you educated where you become more valuable and you make more money? Or you, or what is your situation? You don't know if you don't have conversations with these people. So when we're doing this Christmas ministry, It'd be easy to say, just pull up and we'll load your cart with presents and we'll load your cart with turkeys and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll give us your stuff, we'll email it to us and we'll pay your light bill. That's easy. What's harder is, no, you're, we want you to come here. We want you to sit with us and we want to break bread with you and we want to have conversation with you. We want to learn more about your life and how we can walk shoulder to shoulder with you. So you don't keep living this cycle. And we can't be all things to all people, but I guarantee you, look at your bulletin. Look at the very quote on this page, on this bulletin. I hope you put that on the refrigerator. I hope you memorize this quote from Bonhoeffer. Listen to what it says. The person who's in love with their vision of community will destroy the community. But the person who loves the people around them will create community wherever they go. End quote. You want to grow this church? Love the people. Not to send emails and Facebook posts. But do it. Actually walk shoulder to shoulder with them. And you'll be amazed what happens. Go where they're at. Meet them where they're at. Invite them here, of course, but, this, but, but you're trying to help them rediscover life, get plugged in life. That is what we're talking about today. So everybody here is challenged by that. I get you. Not everybody's called to do the same thing. 
So just because Pastor Harold's over here doing all this stuff in, in the recovery world doesn't mean everybody else here has to do the same thing. But you might have your own calling. It could be just working with kids and helping kids learn how to read, and you're going to create some program around that. Susie's got a desire to create a shoe ministry to where kids can get new shoes whenever they need new shoes. They don't have to sit and wait. You know, that's, that's a calling. That's a mission. I mean, whatever. But live into it. Figure out what it is, and, and don't use the age card because that's a real, that's a real critical thing. Well, I'm, I'm Pat Bull. That's bull butter. You don't fall into that. You're never too old to, to get into that, to, to do something, whatever it is, and just figure out what it is and pray about. So that's what we're into today. This is where we're going to be into big time in today's uh, message that we're into. So lean into that because that's, that's where we're going um, today for sure. And so Bonhoeffer, he defined cheap grace as forgiveness without repentance. Grace without discipleship and grace without the cross. That's what he would call cheap grace. My life's terrible. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. You need Jesus. You want Jesus? Yes, I want Jesus. Come get baptized. God bless you. Then you go out and live for yourself. Cheap grace. That's what he would call it in a heartbeat. He would call that out in two seconds. I call it zap theology, but it's the same thing. And he Wright would call it a, a two-part gospel. There's a four-part gospel. It's creation. It's, you know, the fall. It's redemption through Jesus, but then it's restoration. It's restoring this piece. Most, most Bibles preached today, all around us, are two parts. You're a sinner. You need Jesus. Period. Case closed. And they're not telling you that, hey, I know your life's terrible, I know you're suffering, I know you're struggling, but you are created in the image of God. You're worth something. But on the back end of that is the restoration piece. This is, see, this is why recovery really shines in the world. Because they deal with that piece, the re- restoration piece. It isn't that they're going to meet you, but they've got a practical way to help you rediscover your life, to walk shoulder to shoulder with you and help you rediscover life. That's a missing piece, I can promise you, in most Christian circles. We can give you charity, we can give you food, we can give you a check, we can give you stuff. But, man, when it really comes time to be invested in somebody and walk shoulder to shoulder with them, help them rediscover life, it's a lost art. This is what he's pointing to. Figure out what that is in your own backyard. Who are those people? And you can't be all things to all people, but you can say, okay, as a collective, here's where we see where we can make a difference. We can step into this community right here, whatever that looks like, and make a difference. And, and it takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of risk. You've got to be willing to fail. You've got to be willing to make mistakes. But you'll be amazed what happens on the back end of that. So as we reflect today on the cost of following Jesus, we need to ask three questions. Number one, what does costly grace mean for us? And you can even personalize it. What does it mean to me? What does that mean? Are you willing to deny yourselves, surrender, and live boldly for Christ no matter what the cost it's easy to say yes to that. The proof's in the action, not to talk. So are you willing to do that? And number three, how does grace, excuse me, God's grace empower us for this journey of discipleship? So how does God, because we can't do it on our own. Left our own devices. I'm, I'm, I'm watching ESPN. You know, I'm watching Netflix. I'm eating turkey, and I'm not doing nothing. Working in my yard, playing some golf, whatever. If it's left to me, that's what I'm doing. And, and you get lots of co-signers for that. So if I'm going to go out and die to myself and live for something, God's ambitions, you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. But you're going to have to be restored to do that. Personally, you've had to overcome your own demons to get to that space, to be, to be really impactful. So we're going to dive into what it means to embrace the costly grace of God and walk narrow, that narrow path to true discipleship. And it definitely is a narrow path. And you may have to change some of these slides of that background that's fucking I think it'll be all right. So number one. Daily denial of self. So not a one and done. It's daily. You wake up, and if I don't know if you're like me, but the radio station a lot of times is defaulted on WIIFM. What's in it for me? It's like just, it's just there by default. And I got a choice. I can really crank it up and get what's in it for me today, man. What's in it for me for my schedule? What am I going to have for lunch? What am I going to do here? What am I going to watch the TV tonight? You know, who's playing football? And just all about me. And it's easy. By default, that happens. But then I have to pause and go, okay, God, 
you know, in some form of prayer, I'm going to die to that and say, use me. You know, just that simple. Here's my life. Let me get out of the way of myself. Use me. Whatever, whoever I need to talk to, whatever I need to do, wherever I need to go, please give me the strength to do that. Our first scripture is Luke chapter 9, 23 through 24. And he said to the crowd, listen to this. This is Jesus talking. This is the God you claim to follow. The Jesus looking God. This is what he says. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. That's that's pretty tall order. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And that's not talking about just some far off thing when you die. It's talking about right now, experiencing heaven on earth. If you die to yourself, you're going to experience the magic. And it's truly magic. And I can sit here all day and tell you stories of the magic. You hear, you've heard many of them. You've met some of them, of the magic. And it's, I wouldn't live for anything else but the magic. And when God brings two people together, it, it, it isn't just to bless one of them. Everybody wins in those exchanges. And so that's what he's asking us to do is die to that. Die, die to all this worldly stuff and live for my ambitions. It doesn't mean be in the world. It doesn't mean you can't watch the Chiefs game or play around a golf. I'm not saying that. But your life, you don't want your life to be that. Because you ain't taking the golf clubs with you and you're not taking your Chiefs jersey with you. Well, you might take a Chiefs jersey, but the, the, <laughs> the mice will eat it before it's all said and done. But he makes it clear that discipleship's not passive. Being, being, following Jesus is not just some, I got a cool necklace, I got a bumper sticker, and I listen to Joy FM. It's about, God, use my life. You know, let me get out of the way of myself. And denying ourselves and taking up the cross daily is a conscious decision. I mean, it, it really, I mean, W-I-F-M. I have to make a conscious decision to do that. And Susie and I do devotions together. We pray together. All that's great, and it's important, and get inspired by it. But I still got to get up and get busy. Take the calls. Go to the places I don't want to end up. Do the stuff. And the spiritual principle isn't just about suffering, but about surrendering. So it's not suffering, it's surrendering this, this, this desire for my own self. It's dying to that. Surrendering our desires, our comforts, and our control to follow Jesus fully. That's what he's asking us to do. So Bonhoeffer embodied this teaching when he chose to return to Germany for the safety of the United States. That's why he went back there. He was out. He got out. He saw what was going on and he got out. But he couldn't live knowing what was going on. So for the safety of the United States, he went back. And he knew he was walking into danger, but he believed true discipleship meant something other than... He knew what it meant. It meant standing with his people and resisting evil no matter what the cost. So if they kill me, so be it. If they put me in jail, so be it. If you read all the disciples, the early disciples, Paul, all of them, Timothy, Luke, Matthew, Mark, John, all of them, Andrew, they all went through that. And none of them went through it until they were filled with the Holy Spirit, though. Really important to know that. None of them went through it until they had the Holy Spirit. But once they had the Holy Spirit, they, walked, they, were, they came all the way in, they sat all the way down, and they were committed to following Jesus, no matter what the cost. Well, that, that calling is no different than ours. And Bonhoeffer's self-denial wasn't rooted in personal strength, but in a deep relationship with God. So you're not going to do that for your own ambition. you know. But if it's something bigger than you, you will. And his daily devotion empowered him to take extraordinary sacrifices, to make extraordinary sacrifices. So how are we actively denying ourselves each day? That's a reflection question. That's what I encourage you to think about. How are you doing that? Or are you doing that? And denial might mean choosing integrity over personal gain or showing grace to someone who's wronged us. So it doesn't have to be some big thing. I mean, it, it, it should be for a bigger purpose, but I mean, you're just going to bring this down to reality. It's about prioritizing God's will above our own desires today. And, and we all are, nobody's perfect at that by no means. And when I get really, I'll get, and I can share it because Susie's here and I don't have a problem being transparent about it. But when I get really busy and, if, and I ask Susie, how's it going? She goes, I feel like I'm number five on the priority list in your life. You know, you're doing a lot of great things, but I'm not anywhere close to the top. 
So that's kind of what I'm talking about. But now, now think about that in a Jesus-centered sense. If you sit down with Jesus and go, Jesus, how are we doing? Yeah. Well, there's five points. I'm number 10 in your life. Thanks for the prayer this morning. Thanks for the, the songs on the way to work. But what, what else was I in your life? And so let you think about that. So that, it might mean that. But if you re, the reflection is, is, is your self-denial evident in your actions? Can I look at your life and see the fruit in your life? That your life is more about whatever your deal is. Can I see it? Can I look at your life and see that? Can others look at your life and see that? And true surrender transforms how we live, how we treat others, and how we make decisions. Transformation Church. Your life should be fully transformed. And if it's not, don't take out the whipping stick and start beating on yourself. Throw away the whipping stick. It's like, God, I'm, I'm ready to turn from this. You know? Help me. You know? Give me the power to do that. The second point, there's old Dietrich. Surrender is obedience. Surrender and obedience. In our scripture, Matthew 17, 7, 13 through 14. Listen again, Jesus talking. Listen to what he says. This is really important. This is where most people miss this. The narrow gate. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. There's a great band wrote a song called Highway to Hell. Some of you might have heard that before. And its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. Meaning that most are going to get on that freeway. And, and see, the, the interpretation is, well, they're going towards, they're going to be burned to death and all this gnashing of teeth. And I've preached on that before. And if you really get into all that, that, that's not even close to what Jesus is talking about most of that stuff. It's so taken out of context and used to guilt people into living a certain way. No, Jesus is telling you, if you're going to die to yourself and really live for my ambitions, very few are really going to do that. A lot of people go out there and live for themselves. But to really come all the way in, sit all the way down, and stay and follow this? Well, you've heard me say it before. There's three types of people in all spiritual contexts. Those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who don't know what's happening at all. all right? And I've been all three of those cats. I had no idea when I entered the world of the spirit what the heck was going on. And I sure watched it happen for a while. But when I got with the make it happen people, totally transformed my life. Changed it forever. And I wouldn't have it any other way. But that's a powerful, powerful, powerful scripture. But the gate to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few will ever find it. And it's frustrating because if you're on that road and you've entered that gate, you want nothing more than as many people to follow you. And most will say, no thanks. Because this, the, the, the invitation into that gate isn't something you do. It's a response. It's just saying, yes, come. That's why. Most, well, no, I've, I've got stuff to do. You know? And that's the world system that's got their mind polluted. But that's the challenge here. And Jesus contrasts two paths. You know, the, the wide and the easy path leading to destruction. And the narrow gate is a hard path leading to a life. A life worthwhile. A life full of fruit, a life that is worth it. You know? Because I guarantee you the day comes when if you get that diagnosis and you can't go anywhere, you're stuck in your bed, you're never going to get out of it again, you're not going to ask for your golf clubs. You know? You're not going to ask for, take some pictures of the lake house and send it to me so I can remember what the lake house looked like. You're going to say, bring me the people I love. And if you're really living a Jesus-centered life, you're probably going to set a record for visitors at the hospital people wanting to come and see you because your life means that much i had a set of twins ronnie and lonnie ronnie who i mentored had a stroke when he was 52 had a, had a heart attack put a stent in a stent went to his brain caused him to have a heart attack or stroke so he was paralyzed on half his body it was a dramatic thing it was a big deal but his twin brother lonnie came from virginia and we were together in the hospital room and we went into the waiting room and he goes can i talk to you for a minute and i go yeah and he goes you know, I'm, I'm totally blown away by how many people are here to support my brother. He goes, and I'll be honest with you, Harold. If I die today, I don't even know if I can get six people to be my pallbearers. So he's comparing and contrasting his life with his twin brother. Grew up in the same house, same parents. But one entered the narrow gate and the other one's living out here. And that's what Jesus is talking about. 
You know, so it's not just this, some will get to heaven and so all the rest are going to burn in hell. And that's, that's a lot of preachers preaching that today. Some are talking about They're talking about right now, in this minute. This is what we're talking about, real life stuff. And so he contrasts those things. Discipleship requires choosing the harder, lesser, unpopular road, unfortunately. So Bonhoeffer understood the narrow path well. He faced opposition from political powers and even within the church because he's an unwavering stand for the gospel. So he was in the face of the leaders of the church. Calling them out. You're all about this church stuff. You got the cool robes, all the money, cool chapels, all the good stuff. What are you doing for all the people out here that are wounded, suffering, and excluded? I can't tell. What about all these Jewish people that are being exterminated? What are you doing for those people? Nothing. Except praying for them on Sunday. And lighting a candle and saying a prayer. You're doing nothing. So he was not only the, the Nazis were after him. But the own church people were after him because he's calling them out. Big time. He faced it from all different lives, unwavering. And despite all of that, despite the danger, he obeyed God's call every turn, even when it led to the imprisonment and eventually his death. Think about Martin Luther King. There's a live example in the United States. He faced all of it and eventually killed him for it. So... So obedience does always mean dramatic, life-changing decisions. It's, it's often just found in the quiet moments when God calls us to forgive somebody that we're unwilling to forgive. Right? It, it might be letting go of bitterness or just stepping out of our faith a little bit. You know, I've been locked into a certain way, but now I'm going to take a leap of faith. I'm going to step out of here for a second. I was spent the weekend in, in uh, Wisconsin, around a couple thousand people, actually. And one of the guys there was from Maryland. He lives in Tennessee now. His name is John. And about five, six years ago, John came to me and said, hey, can we go on a journey together? I just want to unpack some things in my life. And one of those things that he unpacked was he owed a tremendous debt that was really fraud, you know, from, for a printing business in the United States government. But he couldn't just go back and, and lay himself out to be slaughtered because that's what would have happened. And he would have been in a lot of trouble and his whole family would have suffered. He goes, so I don't know how to make this right. I said, well, why don't you just take, I said, why don't you just take some money and set it aside and pray for God to use that in a mighty way and be willing to do whatever. And so he started doing that. John was a troubled teen. He, he grew up in a troubled way. He went to a recovery school, the first one in the country, a recovery high school. So people that were struggling with addiction, you know, and they got kicked out of every school they were a part of. They had these special schools. Some, you might have alternative schools around here. That might be kind of what it looks like. But this is strictly for people that are suffering from substance abuse. So he was out, and there was a school that went under. And long story short, he got a call and says, you know, what are we going to do with this school? You know, and he, and, uh, and he says, hey, you ever heard of those recovery high schools? And John goes, yeah, I went to the very first one in the United States. He goes, I think that might be a great place for a recovery high school. So John calls and says, hey, I think I know where I can put this money to start the school. He goes, but it seems pretty impossible. So I want you to think about this story in context of what we're doing right now in this church, where we're at in this church. So just think about this. And so he says to this guy, he, so he puts it out there and he gets with this school teacher that's a friend of his wife's and says, she goes, I know you're going to ask me to be a part of this. I know you're going to ask me to be a part of this. And he goes, and I don't even know what I'm doing, but she said yes. And they started this journey and, and, and putting people together and they got 10 people together and then it was 20 and then it was 30. And then they needed to raise some funds and they got to where they had a couple hundred thousand dollars saved up already. But a philanthropist that had a lot of money came into their life and he went out to dinner with him and his wife. And his wife was into it, but he wasn't. He, was, he liked the concept, but he didn't like this building they had chose out. And he says, look, this building you're trying to buy, I'm not, I'm, it's gonna, you're, you're going to lose. It's, it's going to kill you in the future. So I'm out. Sorry. So he's all bummed out and went home. And later that night, the guy calls him on July 4th, calls him, says, I'm sitting out. And now his wife had a lot to do with it because she was in, all in about this thing. And he had just bought two buildings. One was a YMCA building and was in another building he bought right next to it. And the only reason he bought that building is so no knuckleheads moved into it and ruined this operation. It's the only reason he bought it. 
So I got this building, come over and check it out. And this building was just a perfect spot, location for everything. He goes, well, I don't know how we're going to, it's a $2 million building, and we don't have that kind of money. He says, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you the building to start this school. He says, if you can keep it going for five years, you don't owe me nothing. And that's been seven years ago, I think, six, seven years ago. And they had their first graduate who's in Maine right now going to college and an honor student in Maine. So this is the, the, the point I'm making, that, that it's just do kingdom stuff. Just put yourself out there. And that's just an example of, of living a Jesus-centered life and what that looks like and what God can do with that. But he, but he needs us to do it. You know, he's, it, it, we got to show up. we got to participate and trust the process. So are you willing to follow Christ when it leads to discomfort and sacrifice? What did it mean for him? It meant a lot of meetings and time and energy and asking people for money, asking people for help, asking that teacher to help him out. I mean, it meant a lot. It meant take him this money he set aside and give it up for this cause he didn't even know if it was going to work or not. That's what we're talking about. So ask yourself, what is God calling me to surrender for his sake? What do I got that God needs for me, wants for me? Really? And why am I hanging on to it? Why am I so controlling of my money and my time and my gifts? Why? And it's because of the world system, which we just studied a whole series about that. There's Bonhoeffer in real life. So lastly, live boldly, boldly for Christ. And here's the lesson. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. So you see the shift? He went from a taker to a giver. He went from a world system person to a Jesus-centered person, to, to the world, to, 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 a, to the world of the Spirit. Yes, everything else is worthless when it's compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all garbage so I could, could gain Christ. That's Bonhoeffer. That's what that guy did. That's what he gave up. And Paul's words remind us that nothing compares to the vow of knowing Christ. For Bonhoeffer, the truth shaped his life. It shaped his life. Bonhoeffer lived out this passage not only for the resistance of the Nazi oppression, but in his everyday choices to align every part of his life with Christ's teachings. He didn't wait for somebody else to do it. He didn't wait for somebody else to act. Right? He just, he lived his life with boldness and conviction. And if he didn't like it, get out of the way. Move. Next. Because this is where we're going. I'm not into the zap theology and all the casualness anymore. I want to live for something bigger. Right? That's what he's telling him. So living boldly for Christ means standing for truth and justice, even if it's unpopular. And, and I guarantee you, if you're going to go serve the, the wounded, the excluded, and the suffering, it's going to be unpopular. Because if, if you said, I'm going to go out and make a, I'm going to create a nonprofit, I'm going to go do something to really help the unhoused commi community in Jefferson County, and you would have a lot of opposition and say, we don't even want them here anyway. Let's push them to the city. Let's push them over to Franklin County. Let's get them out of our county. That's their MO. And you're like, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to serve them right here with our tax money and our resources. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where are you gonna, you're going to hear about it. Might even be threatened. It means reflecting Christ in our work, relationships, and communities, regardless of the cost. And so reflect on it for a minute. Are we living passively in our faith? Or are we willing to take risk in everything for the gospel? Well, you can say yes all day. You can raise your hand to that. But the proof's in your actions. The proof's in your resume. The proof's in your life. I'll leave that for you to wrestle with. So in conclusion... Last week we learned about faith in action. This week we recognize that truth, discipleship, at no co has a cost. And Bonhoeffer's life reminds us that cheap grace, grace without transformation, even without that restoration piece, isn't truly grace at all. That's why I get these calls a lot. I'm thinking about getting rebaptized. I'm thinking about giving my life to Jesus again. Well, let's just be real. He never gave it to him to start with. And I know that you don't like hearing that, but that's the reality. There's a lot of people around church this day, they'll, they'll, they'll get an altar call. Hey, if you're a sinner, if you're struggling, you come forward, please. We want to pray over you. It's beautiful. 
When you get goosebumps, you raise your hand, and you're saved. And check in my book how many lives got saved in this church. That we saved 40 lives. We, like we did it. We saved 40 lives. But if I went in and said, okay, let's, let's audit these 40 people. Tell me about the restoration process. They'd be like, what do you mean? They're in discipleship classes. Discipleship what? You're teaching them how to give you money? How to, how to serve the church? What do you mean? That, what are you doing to restore these people? Let's get real here. Well, nothing. Because they got Jesus now, they don't need to do all that. Okay, well, show me where that's in the gospel, in the Bible. Because you can't. So it's, it's really important to get that. Costly grace is not earned, but it compels us to respond with our whole lives. And grace, and we need God's grace, the Holy Spirit in life, it empowers us to deny ourselves daily, surrender to obedience, even when it's hard, even when it's terrible, and life boldly for, live boldly for Christ, regardless of the cross. There's many times I get phone calls, and it's like, oh, man, I don't really want to talk to that person or call them back. Or go there. I'm tired. It happens all the time. But I'm committed, so I just go. I might have those thoughts. I don't have to beat myself up. I'm a human being. But the key is in the action that I just get up and go do it. You know? And, 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 and in the recovery world, where we're working with new people a lot of times, it's like you, you ask them to do something, it's like you ask them to pull teeth. And they're like, I have a, shut up and get in the car. <laughs> It's some of the most spiritual words on the planet. Just shut up and get in the car. You know? You know and that's it. And it's like this. Just shut up and be here on the 21st and help pack boxes. And help, quit worrying about all this stuff. Just do it. Just be a Nike Christian. There'll be a swish on your head. Just do it. So reflection questions as we close out. Are you willing to embrace the cost of discipleship in your own life? To thine own self be true. How is God's grace equipping you to surrender, trust, and live boldly? And here, we saw this in the, in the bumper video. It's a powerful quote. Listen to this quote by Bonhoeffer. It's this one of the most convicting quotes in all scripture language. When Christ calls a man, I think I even got it here. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Are you willing to do that? It's easy to say yes. Proofs in the pudding. Bonhoeffer did. Bonhoeffer did, and we'll see that today in, in the movie. So the key takeaways, daily denial of self, and I think we've got those as well. Daily denial of self-discipleship is a daily choice to prioritize God's will above our own. To die to ourselves and live for God's ambitions. Two, surrender in obedience. Obedience is not optional. Living a Jesus-centered life is not something that I just... Okay, I'll do that today, but not tomorrow. It's essential to walk in that narrow path to live a Jesus-centered life. Lastly, live boldly for Christ. True discipleship requires us to live with boldness and conviction, even at significant cost. So again, some of us are going to the movies today to see this played out and dramatized. If you can't make it, try to see it at some point before it gets out of the theaters, or you can wait till it comes out on Netflix. But there's other Bonhoeffer movies out there as well. Maybe pick one of those and watch it over the holidays. I just encourage you to really enhance this message. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of costly grace, a grace that transforms us and calls us to follow you wholeheartedly. Teach us to deny ourselves, to walk in obedience, and to live boldly for you no matter the cost. Empower us with your grace to live lives that reflect your kingdom and bring hope to the world. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hi again, this is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know more about us, we are Transformation Church. We are a church for people who aren't in the church. We are a Jesus-centered community made up of everyday people just like you. We refer to ourselves as Transformers, committed to helping God change the world. We meet on Sunday mornings at 1030 a.m. at our House Springs campus. We are moving and launching a new campus soon in Eureka, Missouri, scheduled to launch on April 6, 2025, and we would love for you to join us and be a part of this Jesus revolution. We also meet during the week in smaller groups called house churches, and that's how we make it relational. We regularly hear from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, 
Instagram, Vimeo, YouTube, and TikTok. You can also download our app for free and for fun from your favorite app store. You can find the download link in the show notes or on our website at www.transformerforlife.org. That's www.transformer, the number four, life, L-I-F-E, dot O-R-G. Inside our app or on our website, you can access all our available audio and video teachings and view and download our bulletin, sermon notes, slides, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. Lastly, if you want to learn more about supporting Transformation Church with your time, talent, and finances, and what it takes to become a Transformer, please visit our website. God loves generous people, and so do we. So a gift of any amount of your time, talent, and finances is much appreciated. Hey, thanks for being a member of our extended Jesus-centered community. I'm glad we are on this journey together, walking shoulder to shoulder, helping people experience a Jesus-centered life, and discovering the kingdom of God.